Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. This is the first episode in hopefully a brand new um, series, not really um, a series dealing with a particular case, but actually dealing with particular themes and, and books. We're going to be talking about my books and it might surprise you some of the books that I've written. It surprised Stephanie, who, who we've got on this very first episode. Hi, Stephanie. Hi. You're in Connecticut, right? I am. It's very, very cold. It feels like below zero here today. It's really warm here and we having almost tropical weather, which is very unusual, very wet, very humid, um, very, well, the warmness is normal, but the, the other stuff isn't. Um, what are you wearing, Stephanie? <laughs> <laughs> there we go, there we go, okay, very good. Does that make sense? So, did, um, so we're gonna deal with the Mountain Mania books. There are five books in this series. They're actually meant to be five books in the original Neverest series, but I haven't quite finished them. Um, I was hoping to do the fourth book on the Sherpas. Um, did, did that make sense? Did, when you re read about almost like a true crime analysis of climbing mountains, so, you know, what are the motives of the people? Whose fault was it? Who is to blame? What evidence was there behind? What do we know? What statements were made? Did you, did you find a crossover between the two? I did. Um, when I was reading your true crime books, I found it quite, you, you would say, shocking that um, the, the Neverest or the Mount Everest was in your um, genre. And I thought, well, maybe it's because he's kind of outdoorsy and thought it would just be something totally separate. But you actually used um, the experiences of the mountain climbers as um, a, almost like a homicide and the mountain mm. scene as a crime scene. I think in a way, the question was, is the, is the murder of the mountain, the weather, or a person? It was, it was sort of um, taking that approach but then and then also um, uh, um, you know in the true crime methodology you you try and find out what is the identity of a person you know who are they right hold on one second okay oh God. I hope we don't have to start over no, I don't think so. Look, I am recording it on my computer. Hopefully there's, there's sound as well. Okay. Okay, so, yeah, so, I mean, you use some of the same approaches, which is um, things like timing and context and who are these people? So, for example, if you're a journalist, what, what is your motive to be on the mountain? If you're a lawyer, what's your motive to be on the mountain or off the mountain? If you're the guide on your first expedition, what's going on with you? If you're a very experienced guide, how do you think about a inexperienced client? If you're a very rich client, but you a very poor climber, you know, all that kind of thing. So um, I think probably the, the reason why I wrote um, the first book, I, I didn't really realize the first book was going to be such a success for a very long time, Neverest was my most successful book. It was very popular. Um, and then it was also very well reviewed. And then somewhere along the line, the reviews got quite scathing. And I think it was from the people who actually climb Everest, people who actually do it. And I don't think they liked the idea of someone who hasn't climbed Everest. Um, basically, someone who's got, not got a horse in the race, basically saying, um, you know, second guessing their motives. And if you think about it, a lot of money, energy, investment goes into climbing the mountain. So someone is sitting on the side, almost like with his arms folded and going, well, do you guys realize what you look like? Do you realize what this looks like? Do you realize mm -hmm. what the spectacle looks like? 
then it comes across as cynical and bitter and but the idea is to look at it from a neutral perspective and say what actually happened here the same as a crime when a crime happens you don't have a, a foot in the race you don't you're not on this this person's family or, or that law enforcement you're not a relative of law enforcement and I think it's very difficult for the people who are involved not to feel um, they, they, like they, they want to feel, they want to feel vindicated and they want to read a story of adventure and heroism and so when someone says was that heroic or was it cowardice was it craven was it you know what is actually going on here and what is quite interesting when you look at the some of the narratives everyone has written their own book they're the heroes in their own story whereas when someone writes about somebody else so it's somebody's book i'm talking about mm -hmm. the, the the well known books in the dealing with the 96 everest disaster where there are, are books about the individual when they talk about another person then they are very quick to say something negative about that person whereas when something's ne negative sent about them they just can't believe it it's you've misunderstood and so from being not involved in the whole thing i think you can be more objective about what what were the actual overarching dynamics going on here you know yeah i can see how the individual climbers have they read the books about <laughs> their experience might feel like they are being under a microscope being judged um and i would also think that climbers if you say some of your audience might be people that are professional climbers or more avid climbers, maybe they feel like you don't have the, the picture of what actually goes on. But because you even you wrote, I think, on your uh, biography page that you're an amateur climber. But the fact that you have any experience at all, I think, mm. gives you a unique perspective as well as the fact that you are and have been a photojournalist and an author. So the climbers may not only feel like you're they're being judged by someone in the media, but also by someone who has mm. some kind of experience. Yeah. Can you remember which book it was where I spoke about being a journalist on a hike? and what that was like this was this was obviously no, no it wasn't life in, life threatening and there were other tourists involved there just more normal tourists and i think we were two photographers and 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 then there was a journalist as well and what was quite interesting was there were certain people who just didn't like the fact that they were being kind of you know photographed around every certain kind of path and I remember at one point um, there was a journalist who, who, who was actually literally lying down on the ground um, and you had to, you know, this group of us needed to walk by and literally walk over the camera while she was taking photos. Yeah. And that, that's not quite natural. <laughs> no. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's fun and it's not a problem once or twice, but when it's that going on, you, you're sort of no longer looking at nature and enjoying the experience. It's now this photo opportunity and this angle, and can you do that again? And it gets irritating. And my, um, you know, me being a photojournalist, I want to be um, almost like you, you don't know that I'm there. You know what I mean? I might take a photo from a distance, or I'm not going to be in your face taking photos of what's going on. I understand that kind of photojournalism is quite good, but I don't want to be ruining the experience for people. I want to kind of be in the background. The, yeah, focus more on the nature side than the people in nature. I understand how that 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 can look sometimes, but I, all I'm saying is, and so uh, you can definitely get a sense of tension and pressure and. Um, sort of almost like groups forming where well i don't i really like this journalist and i like my photo taken and i want to be in this magazine article and i want to participate and the other group saying 
this is not what I signed up for. I'm not here to be part of your story. I, I want to yeah. I want to enjoy this. You know, I want to have an experience in nature. Some people you remember which book that that was in. I think it it was either Neverest or Neverest Two. Okay. I think it it might have been the first I think it was the first one because I remember learning about that early on about you and your experience and I think that the that climbers it depends on what their purpose for for their experiences or for going on the expedition are they going to just re reach a goal are are they there to make history are they there to be in some big story, um, whereas some people who are more like paying clients might not be in that same position as say one of the guides who is mm. um, paying to have someone there to do that for them. Yeah. Okay, so just for those who aren't aware of it, in April, May, 1996 was one of the deadliest years climbing Everest there have been deadlier years, but they, they've all had to do with, I think, earthquakes and avalanches. Um, and 1996 was really a year where the commercialization of Everest had happened. And there was this competition essentially between uh, these very slick um, um, climbing, commercial climbing expeditions specifically uh, Mountain Madness and the Adventure Consultants. Um, Adventure Consultants was headed by Rob Hall and Mountain Madness by Scott Fisher. So basically an American, I don't want to say versus a, um, a New Zealander, but, but, a, but because in the end they actually climbed the same day and they were going to operate and so on. But there was definitely a, um, almost like a, prize waiting for which group summited the best, which group got to the summit first, um, which group had the best journalist, and, and there were literally two different journalists on the two different teams. And um, I think when you go into it, Sandy Hill Pittman um, had a, a definite impact on the team that she was in. And she was on the Mountain Madness team. Yeah. And John Krakauer also had an impact on the team that he was in. And the you couldn't have it have you couldn't you couldn't have had a more different pair of journalists. Um, the one was a, a a climber that knew the outdoors, that wrote for outdoor magazine, that he was that a pretty good a, climber. Yeah, he had a pretty good kind of pedigree. And I must say, um, you know, reading his other books, he, he, he seems like he's like a man's man. He's sort of very outdoorsy, um, but he's also quite cerebral. You know, he, he thinks in a, in a, I don't know, he's quite a heroic figure in, a, in his own right. Whereas um, Sandy Hill was just totally different. Um, it's almost like if you had to imagine one of the Kardashians climbing Everest. <laughs> uh, she like a socialite, a league of her own. Absolutely. Like, um, look at me. Not a clue about climbing. Yeah, almost like, um, who's that lady who um, does Martha, is it Martha, Martha Stewart? What's her name? Um, I'm sorry, what did the, you the ask? Cooking, the cooking thing. Yeah, from, Martha Stewart. Martha mm -hmm. Stewart. Almost like doing a Martha Stewart thing on the slopes of Everest. Uh, look at this. Limoges that I've got to look at, look at this china. I'm making this tea with this beautiful tea set and whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's all very cute, except somebody's got to carry that SHIT up and somebody's mm -hmm. got to, you know, maintain all of this stuff. And I mean, she Interestingly had, enough, she uh, ended up in prison for, for fraud or something for a few yeah, years. No, that is, that is also quite interesting. So, so if you think about it, um, I almost said Martha Stewart, Sandy Hill's got this absolute, this is her vision for herself, for, for this climb. This is how she sees it happening. And it's totally different to almost what everybody else wants to do. She is going to write the story, but it's also going to be this very kind of exotic, glamorous experience. And 
there were some shenanigans going on. I won't really say much about them here, but there's some shenanigans going on in the tent that that even upset the Sherpas. And then, anyway, and then you have Krakauer, um, who is a journalist, but now he's also this, this really fit, strong, experienced climber. And now he's also got clients on his team who are sort of, I won't say, they're sort of like chubby corporate fellows and they not um maybe very strong and they're struggling they were, and and so they you were have considered the more the more um the older and slower group mm -hmm. the one on rob halls at a venture consultants and they were a lot more culturally diverse yeah the the funny thing with and I, I experienced this when I climbed, and I, and I realized if you're a big, maybe if you've climbed Everest or if you've climbed any of the 8,000 meter peaks, then this will kind of be like a joke to you. But when I climbed Kilimanjaro, which is two thirds the height of, of Everest, even though Kilimanjaro has been climbed thousands of times before, there was definitely a sense on that day of who's going to get to the top first. There's definitely a sense of, okay, we in the front group and we're doing well and we want to keep it up and kind of thing. There's definitely a sense of competition. There's definitely a sense of I'm better than you and that guy's stronger and whatever, whatever. And I think on Everest, it's even more like that. It's just different because on Everest, if you overextend yourself, you can die. And if you don't admit your weakness, you can die. If you if you are too confident and too determined, you can die. You know um, of the cold, of lack of oxygen, of um, cerebral edema, all these different kind of things. So you've kind of got to be honest. You've got to be honest and humble about what's going on. And all of that kind of goes out the window when you've got two journalists on board and they are watching. And the whole point of the journalist being there. I mean, let's face it. The whole point of the journalist being there is a PR exercise, right? Mm -hmm. The whole point of the journalist being there is to say, I had this wonderful experience. Um, the, the, the guides were top notch. The views were amazing. And I highly recommend this to you. So in a scenario like that, if you're the client and you're part of the story about how wonderful everything is, you're going to be sort of... Um, raining on, on the parade if you sort of put your hand up and say i am not feeling so great i'm going home you know mm -hmm. that's going to probably be part of the story so what are you going to do you're going to put on a brave face now what i think is very interesting is um i'm quite embarrassed that i can't actually remember the guy's name who was the who's the guy who um who's part of his face froze and back uh, weathers yeah back weathers um what was really interesting with him was he he never actually gave up, if I can put it that way. So he was climbing. He was climbing, he and was then pretty much on his own. At yeah, the no. End. But what I mean is, he never basically acknowledged, okay, I am giving up. He basically climbed, and then they said, okay, you need to go down or whatever. And he was just like, no, I will just, I'm just going to wait here. I'm just going to, you know. He, so there was never really an admission that I have failed or I'm. I'm done. It, it was just sort of, um, it's sort of not there. It's just not there. And if he had just done that, if he just said, okay, I can't do this. And he would, he could have saved his, you know, his fingers and, and, and he could have saved other lives as well. And also, I don't think what happened to Yasuka number would have happened. You know, I don't think if, because if they, if, if, he used up the resources. Yeah, yeah. And unnecessarily. It wasn't only him, it was also Sandy Hill coming down and you know someone needed to if I was the if I was the guide, I probably would also have said, guard her with your life, make sure, absolutely sure that she's fine. You know what I mean? So she Yeah, that would look chaperone. very good if something had happened to her. Yeah, and then but as soon as you have that, it basically means especially if she's climbing slowly or struggling, then everything slows down and th that puts are, lives in danger, you know? Are you, are you speaking of, of Sandy Pittman? 
yeah. journals or yeah. or Namba? Okay. Yeah, no, no. I'm talking about Sandy went on her way down. I think slowed right. down everything, and then you had when they really needed to pick up the pace. That's when they bumped into Beck Weathers, who's basically still sitting where he originally was. That's why I just say, and I do I, I admit that you know sitting in your comfortable chair at the bottom of the mountain, it's a little bit different. But let's face it. Beckwithers never got to the top. So if he just acknowledged where he was, okay, I'm not climbing to the top. I'm not, I, I failed. I'm not going to go down. If he just did, done that, he wouldn't have needed rescuing just from that point where he was to lower down. And right. although his story is sketched as this incredible heroic story, I see it in a totally different way. I see it as a as a as a crazy sideshow on the mountain that shouldn't have happened and um i don't see it as a heroic thing at all i see it as as hubris and and that's really a word that i think i bring up quite a lot in the narratives which is you know you climb the mountain to get a sense of your own power and imminence in this world and, and what happens you might find that that you're not very powerful that you're not a very good person that you're very not your motives aren't very good at all and, and the mountain shows that to you so you go to the mountain to become a hero only to return either as a villain or as a liar or as a um opportunist or whatever 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 and and it's hard for some some people to face that when they may not realize that beforehand yeah. and then they try to hide it when they come back down. So, um, although I was aware that it's quite a merciless tone that I was taking in these books, um, I was also the first person to say, so in other words, it's quite a merciless tone, but I was also the first person to say, if it's, if I was in that situation, then, then what would I have done? And I'm, and I'm not sort of saying if I was in that situation, I would have been the hero. I'm saying no matter who was in that situation, what would have happened? And as a way of expressing that, I, I gave the example of when I climbed Kilimanjaro, my brother was in real difficulty and I abandoned him basically. I mean, it was basically a situation where it was not very well planned, but I didn't have very good, uh, we, didn't, we had very little water. He actually had no water and he was in some kind of distress before the, the final climb. So it's about a three, it's about, I think three days to the top and one or two down, or it's four days to the top and one or two down, one down. And um, actually it is, it's about half a day down and then the next day you go down. But um, so he was in some distress and I could have just sat with him and used up my water and, and just, um, and I didn't. I basically said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. You need to sort out your situation. You don't, have, so, so another way of looking at it is he needed to self-manage himself in terms of his own supplies. I'm not responsible for that, but another person can say, Yes, you are responsible. And if anything's responsible, um, his own brother should be responsible. But ultimately what happened was um, he, he wasn't feeling very really good. He started falling behind. And then, you know, I helped him to a point. And then I basically said, look, I'm going to go on. I, I actually think you should get some water from somebody or, or sort out your situation. Otherwise, you must go down. But I wasn't going to go down, you know, but this is obviously not Everest. And anyway, to cut a long story short, I had quite a good climb. And it turned out that my father actually caught up to my brother. My father. I was just going to ask if this was the a climb that your father had joined you to on. Yeah, no, he was there. So my father actually um, helped him up. And they obviously had quite a good father-son experience. But what was... Also quite interesting was the guides repeatedly said to my father, he must go down in terms of my brother. So in other words, even the guides were saying, because um, my, my brother had diarrhea and he was under like a certain amount of distress. But, you know, I had, I had like 
not enough water even for myself, let alone for the both of us to continue climb, climbing. And I, I was relying on the gods when I got to the summit because, you know, you can say, well, yeah, you can just eat some ice up there, but you've got to go somewhere off the safe part of the slope to get to that snow. And I was just fortunate that some of the people I climbed with had, um, you know, you can also have fluid, but it's frozen. And so I was fortunate that so someone that I climbed with had, I think, orange juice. And he was carrying it against his chest. And so, and he allowed me a sip of it. But even so, you know, I've done the Ironman and I think I did the Ironman in 12 hours something. That day climbing, I think it was 15 hours. And if someone had said to me, you know, you're going to be on your feet, walking with a headache virtually the whole day with like, I don't know, it's like, um, you know, um, a tenth of a, too. with a tenth of a liter of water for 15 hours. Um, do you want, do you really want to do that? And obviously what did happen was I, I got a little bit of water here and I got a, a sweet from that person. And then there were, there were places where we got additional water at a little tap at the bottom. But I, I think the, the lesson that certainly that I learned from that experience was you need to plan in advance. You need to know how your suppliers are, are going. And I think, what that also showed, I mean, nobody died. My brother got to the summit. Um, it actually started snowing while my father and my brother were at the top. Um, but they, they came down hours and hours after we we completed that whole circuit. Um, but you've got were to- Were you worried or was your mindset on your climbing? I was worried, but I've got to say, you, you are in a certain amount of distress yourself. You You- are tired, you haven't, I mean, you get up at one o'clock that morning to climb, right? So, so you've had one or two hours sleep yourself. So you, you're certainly not in that position of, you know, you can write an algebra exam and pass with flying colors. You, you are definitely compromised. You're tired, you're hungry. I was quite sick as well. I wasn't as sick as my brother, but I, I was, I mean. You, you, you mentioned yeah. that, um and some of the very unglamorous parts of climbing. And, you know, a lot of people think that it's this fairy tale, mm. but there's a lot of ugly. Absolutely. Um, climbing Kilimanjaro cured me of my, I was in thrall of this idea of, I wanted to go to the Himalayas, I wanted to climb, I wanted to do that whole thing. And I, to be honest, I still do. And I was actually you mentioned that a couple times in some of your writing, I think, and even on some of your videos that that was something that you had planned to do. I don't know if it was in 2021 originally yeah, before in coronavirus. In 2020, I was I was originally going to go to America, oh, okay. and then um, something happened, and then then I was actually planning to go to the Himalayas. I was literally talking to a Sherpa and I actually think he's the guy who's climbed Everest the most that's the Sherpa I was talking to and I, I was quite bold over because it's like wow so when you're not climbing Everest you'll just you can kind of chaperone a total amateur kind of thing but you did want quite a lot of money and I was kind of thinking maybe I can combine it's a typical way that I do think maybe I can combine an interesting hike you know, something that I want to do with being with this absolutely world-class guy and I can I can get some information out of him because I'll, the next book I do want to write is about the Sherpas. So I could get some information firsthand and you, you at the Himalayas, it's not by email or something, you're like literally right there and just get a kind of a interview with him, um, but not over half an hour, an hour, over nine or 10 days. Mm -hmm. So you get to know his experience, you get to know his diet, you get to know his philosophy, you get to know the little stories about what he's experienced. So I was kind of lining up myself for that um, when coronavirus happened. And I was kind of asking different people, is this price that he's asked exorbitant? And they were like, that's crazy. You know, and so that's obviously because he's such a 
celebrity could kind of charge you quite a quite a high price. Ask and, for that. Yeah, and I was kind of thinking, should I do it? I mean, you know, I would get a great book out of it and it would be a very authentic story. And then the 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 solution, uh, you know, there was no solution because coronavirus happened. So but anyway, I was I was in the process of of planning a trip to to the Himalayas, literally emailing the guy, and he was he was wanting to know, okay, is this happening? Or you have you paid the deposit? And what I, what I was going to do is the Annapurna circuit. So not climbing the mountain, but climbing or hiking around the base of the mountain. But you know, it it was quite a scary thought because. The bottom of Annapurna and the bottom of Everest is, is as high as I've ever climbed in my life. So, so it's higher than Kilimanjaro, which is six kilometers into the sky. That's the bottom of these mountains. That's hiking along the bottom, which means the air is going to be thin. You're going to be cold. And um, so, you know, I've often asked myself, you know, if you, do, if you did have to climb... Everest or, or some kind of really high mountain, how do you think you would do it? At this point, I think I would do terribly because I don't sleep very well. And I think if you don't sleep very well and then that aggravates, I think you can get sick very, very quickly. And I think you can make mistakes very, very quickly. You know what would I mean? That, that would be, have to be something that you would have to, to train for physically. Or, I mean, I know like Sandy... Hill Pittman, she didn't, she did terribly. You're obviously much more fit than her, but would that be something that you would have to take into consideration before you went? Yeah, I think it doesn't do any harm if you are um, physically, if, if, for example, if you light and thin, I don't think it does any harm. If, you, yeah. if you've got good ultra marathon or, or not ultra marathon, but just good aerobic fitness. You know what I mean? I don't think that does any harm. And also, if you look at um, uh, Bo Creef, who's, uh, I mean, I consider him the absolute hero of the Everest disaster. Some people consider him Krakauer um, in his who, who initial did you say? Bo Creef, Anatoly. Oh, 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 okay. That's how you say it. Well, that's how I say it. Um, yeah. He, he was the Russian dude, but he was. He was seen, certainly the way some people read John Krakauer's book as the villain of the story. That you know, Very sad. he should have had, he should have had oxygen. He shouldn't have done this. He should have done that. Meanwhile, he's the guy who actually saved people. John, did John Krakauer save anybody? And he was one of the strongest climbers himself. And so he actually know, said, he one of his responses was well nobody asked me to help them find mm. the missing climbers mm. yeah. like he had to be asked yeah you know whereas uh Bo Kriev just he just went he just yeah and I mean the amazing one thing after with, another yeah I mean the amazing thing couldn't. with him was he was saving people I think not even on his team he was helping whole groups of people he and was then, and, and I mean, the only even, one he didn't save was um Yosiko Namba yeah and Scott Fisher I mean he the fact and, that he and, climbed up all the way and then he climbed up again and he actually got to Scott Fisher. You know, I found that very, very, very sad, but also found it an incredible feat from this guy. And it's just too bad that he died something like two years later. Yeah. And and he his again, his um climbing expertise and resources could have been used for Fisher, as you said, if Beck Weathers had not made the decision to sit mm -hmm. there as you, I think you made me laugh, said a big giant frozen ice cream. Yeah. I can't remember, <laughs> like I've, I wrote these books on the 20 year anniversary, so I haven't actually looked at them for five years. This year is the 25 year anniversary, but I remember so I can't remember the guy's name, even though I thought about this in detail, but I remember there was a guy who I think was a postal worker who went up with, um, I think it was Rob Hall and it was his I second think attempt. Doug, it was Doug Han or let me see, I have it here. Um, Doug, Doug Hansen. Hansen. Yeah. And so that was a, 
very tragic scenario where Rob Hall, who's, who, who I think was always quite a disciplined guy, mentally strong. Sensible. Um, yeah. And, and, be, and again, you've got to say, was this because he felt sorry for Doug Hansen that he, he sort of took him under his wing and was like, look, um, third time lucky, we're, gonna, we're going to do this. Was it... Tried together before. Yeah. Was it because there was a journalist on the team that he thought, if it, I've got to, I've got to get this guy up. You know, this is going to be a PR disaster if this guy doesn't get up. And in a way, maybe he thought by, by, by kind of holding this guy's hand, basically shepherding him to the top, this is the kind of professional guiding we offer. You know, no matter how, what your skill level is, we'll, we'll get you to the top. You can trust us kind of thing. And then bear in mind, there's another team who got most of their members up. So now he's got to get his members up as well. So I think, I think personally it was a combination of the journalist being on board and also the other team competing with him that made him go against his own programming, right? And, well, and part uh, of it is, uh, is, is Hanson's story where he'd already, I think he climbed in the past with Rob Hall and failed. And so yes. Rob Hall had kind of promised him we're going to do it. And, and he, he, he insisted that Rob take him up. He yeah. pretty much dug his heels in and said, I'm going to summit. Yeah. And Doug, I mean, I'm sorry, Rob Hall said, I'm going to take him there. Yeah. And you had mentioned uh, the correspondence that Hansen was having with an elementary school with mm. some children who had sponsored, helped raise funds for him to climb. And he wanted to give them that picture yeah. of him with the flag summiting. And he did get there and, he, and summit. Sadly enough, what one of the hyperlinks shows is him found later frozen in the mountain. I think upside and down or something. Devastating. Yeah. But I mean, so that, that, is the, that is the context that's going on in his mind is, for, you know, like each guy is thinking, one guy might be thinking, what's my wife going to think about this? Another one might be thinking, what are my colleagues at work going to be thinking about this? Another one's thinking of what's outside magazine going to think about this? Another one's thinking, I'm a professional guide. Um, I need to do this and this and this. Um, and the, the, the team leaders are thinking, what's my legacy going to be? They're not thinking about that exact climb. They're thinking, what's, is this going to go into the record books or not? Are we going to win this little thing? You know, what's going to happen? And so for Doug Hansen, it, he was literally in his mind was, what are all these little kids going to think if, if this or if that? And yeah. can you, I mean, if you turn the clock back and you say, if you could speak to Doug and say, Doug, um, would you rather be alive or would you rather see... I want to see you come off the mountain. Yeah, would you rather... Do you want to see, like, all these kids smiling and then they're going to eat an ice cream the next day and they smile there as well? Or do you want to, like, you know, live out your life kind of thing? And obviously, the human spirit is like that where you you um, absolutely determined and the end is just there and you just say to yourself, I've just got to get there, I've just got to take the next step. But it's uh, when you're up there, the psychology unravels and the finish line becomes the top of the mountain. And that's not the finish line. Yeah. The, the, the top of the mountain isn't even halfway, really. Yeah. And what I think is very um, kind of instructional with the Everest disaster is I think it's almost impossible that it's not going to repeat itself given the flocks of people that are going up there now. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if you have something where hundreds of people die because of a situation of there are far too many people, something goes it's wrong, and, and there's just an absolute um, catastrophe. So in the Everest disaster, there's basically about 13 people who died of the entire season. One person, I think the, the, the first casualty actually died several months later. It was a Sherpa who... I think they would have edema and, and but died much, much later. So I think the total casualty number was 13 or something, but on the actual mountain was something like eight or nine or something. But I think you can easily have a number that is 30 or 50 or 100 
in a situation where you've got this whole shopping mall of people queuing almost like at the till, except they're queuing to punch their ticket at the top. And if something goes wrong there, you're going to have lots and lots and lots of people dying. And um, it's, um, I don't know what's more scary, someone being murdered or someone signing up to, to for a disaster. Do you know what I mean? I don't know what's, what's scary. Yeah, it's, it's tragic. It's so tragic. And you, that's something for you to think about when you consider going to the Himalayas. You can be in the best physical shape of your life. You can control your eating. You can control so many pieces of you getting there and your climb. But there are things like the overcrowding or mm. weather elements that you can't control. And when you do sign up to climb, that's something that has to be that is a consider that has to be known is that you're it's the risk you're you're willing to take when you do that is that you won't come back or that something mm -hmm. could happen and it's not it, it seems like a very noble way to go but it's actually a nightmare mm -hmm. just from reading the the stories and I can't even imagine li living what people who suffered on the mountain and survived have gone through. Um, yeah, I think something that is quite creepy and, but, but is very, a very authentic moment, but in a horrible way, is you have these climbers. This is happening all the time. This is happening every season. It's not unique to the 96 season. It's, it's a constant on Everest, which is, I'm going to Everest to punch my ticket I'm going to come back and tell everybody I've climbed Everest. I'm going to give speeches about what a hero I am. But what is actually happening while that's going on? People are stepping over other dead people, literally stepping over them. Um, or there's a dead person just off to the side. And what happens in, in that? Well, you kind of just tune out. It's like, okay, this isn't part of the fairy tale, so that didn't happen. Yeah. I don't think. Another yeah, thing... Yeah, another mind. thing which when you dig into these Everest narratives deeper, which is incredibly troubling, it's very troubling in, in, in many respects, is you climbing and maybe there's someone that, that you don't know. Maybe it's someone that you do know, but now they are in dire straits and it is literally a life and death situation. And then you have people... Um, abandoning them and then they do die and then you say it's difficult to know what to say it's difficult to know whether to say cheapest couldn't you just help that person on the other hand isn't that what everyone agrees at the bottom you know if we go up if i get into trouble it's fine leave me alone it's fine and i'll leave you alone but you you, t you kind of tend to think as you go through these stories because there are so many of these stories if someone says, please help me, please, whatever, and they just, you know, people just step over them. And then they realize, well, they're still alive or this or that. Um, you, you get a weird sense of how the morality up there is almost murderous. It's almost, yeah. you know, like if you, if you have to say, if you have the ability to save somebody and you don't, isn't that murder? And, and to not be held accountable. Yeah, and you might say, you might say, no, it's not. But if you're in that situation and you you elect to follow your that decision, are you telling me it's not going to haunt you for the rest of your life? As you come down from Everest, you've 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 tagged the summit, but someone didn't and they died and they asked for your help. And you know, is that just part of the, the thing? And that's that's part of the you know like as I say there's this heroism on the one side, kind of, hey? like a psychopathy. Absolutely, yeah. It's it it's, is it's, a sense of people becoming psychopaths in in favor of their own narcissism. Because that's not the stories that they write when they survive. Is that mm -hmm. they had to make this life, you know, life and death decision and leave someone behind. It's that they always did everything they could and here yeah. I am, I made it. And it's one thing 
to survive that kind of hell, but it's another thing to survive that kind of, of terror and loss of life, but lie about it. That's mm -hmm. where the piece is that's kind of, you know, like I think that every, I think that when you sign up to do this kind of dangerous uh, mountain climbing that that is something that each person has to know that I may get in trouble. There may be no one who's willing to help me. I may find someone in despair near the end of, on the brink of death, and I may not help them. Mm. But it's if the coming about back it, down and lying about it that yeah. is just- If you think about it in a basic way, you say, I'm going to the mountain to be a hero. I'm going to the mountain to experience myself as a hero and to show people I'm a hero. And then somebody is struggling, they're weak, they need your help. And now you're not being a hero to them, certainly. And then you might not get to the top of the mountain, but if you think about it in a, in a more basic way, you're both on the mountain. Isn't it more heroic to save someone's life than to walk to the top of a, of a, of Take a rock. Your selfie. Yeah. You know, and I don't think there's a question about that. I don't think anyone would argue about that statement, but I think when you're on the mountain, it's a little bit different. And when you pay different mindset, yeah, for some people they paid $60,000, you know, if you paid that amount of money and, and it's like, forget about climbing the mountain, do something else. It, it, it's a little bit difficult to to sort out that programming, you know. So you something just, that that you talk that you just mentioned now that I think is a interesting thing that I don't think people associate with Everest or with these narratives is the idea that you go up the mountain, you come down, and you actually lie about it, right? And that is actually a real allegation that haunts a lot of the Everest 98, sorry, Everest 96 narratives, including John Krakauer's. I mean, John Krakauer's book, Into Thin Air, is probably one of the best books I've ever read. I, I think when I read it, I probably read it in a day and a half, maybe three days. It's one of the best books I've ever read. But my thoughts about it changed when I read other books. And then you kind of got the sense of why do these narratives not line up? Why is... Mm -hmm his story about that guy, not the same as that guy's story about that guy. And then it gets even more complicated when it's a book by John Krakauer, a, a book on a, a book basically written by Anatoly Bokrief. I've actually contacted the author of that book and we, we get, we're in touch quite a lot. And then Beck Weathers wrote a book, then Luca Shiska wrote a book, and then there are quite a lot of books written by other people who were there were not weren't necessarily on those expeditions. And then you kind of get the, the weird sense of, wow, what you said and what this guy's saying isn't the same. And that's a bit weird. And your Why story, don't they align? Yeah, your story about you is awesome, but someone else's story about you is not that great. What's going on here? Right. And that, and, and that, that is why I say maybe you need another perspective into it from someone who wasn't there, wasn't even on the mountain, who can take all the narratives the same way that you do with John Bernay Ramsey. You say, okay, right. John said this, Patsy said that, Detective Thomas said that, the evidence said that, Blue Smith said that. Um, what, Find the actual what, truth. Yeah, you know, probably what happened here. So in other words, you, you take all the narratives and then you try and make sense out of it. And... Um, you sometimes need to do that. You need to synthesize out of all the threads, the, the, the golden thread that's, that's, that's hiding in there. And I don't think the person to do that is somebody who climbed in those circumstances. That specific. You know, you need someone who is neutral, someone who's, you know, someone who wasn't there. And, but anyway, I'm quite sad, that, you know, if I look at my, if I look at Neverest now, it's got 75 ratings. Um, it has what? 75 reviews or ratings. Um, it's actually mm -hmm. below 3.3 stars, which for me is quite sad. I mean, it basically shows that quite a lot of people aren't, aren't very happy with the book. I don't know. I loved it. 
I loved it. And your second book really never is too <laughs> went into more of the, um, the thought process and finding all those pieces of truth and saying when these people were missing and lost and other and some people uh, very few people were trying to find them what were the team members actually doing what were mm -hmm. they doing mm -hmm. and when you're able to piece together where they are what was said through radio what they were doing is actually quite was surprising mm -hmm. Yeah. They were, you know, they were, they were resting in tents, essentially. So especially when you have one guy who's running around scrambling in the storm. Another guy is apparently praying or sleeping the entire time. You know, and if you look at yeah. John Krakauer, I'm not quite sure what he was doing. Maybe he was on the radio, but he, he was listening. He was listening play by play. Yeah, I mean, to what he, he could have on. done other things and, you know, when he gets off the mountain, uh, Anatoly's what an idiot, but he was the guy who got out of his tent and did something, you know. Um, and of course, I don't think Krakauer, I don't think he imagined that he would actually get a reply from this Russian who could barely speak English. I think he thought, I can put my narrative out there and it's going to be undisputed. It's going to be this absolute triumph of journalism, and it was. But I think what he didn't expect was to get a, a reply. Book back. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what is incredible is, as um, inarticulate as Bo Creep was, it's a really, really amazing book that was written. You know, it's, it's a very articulate book written by someone who wasn't actually English speaking. It's, it's really incredible. Yeah. And then you had, you know, other narratives as well. Um, but let's move on. So I just want to be clear, the, the first book in the Never series is about, it sort of takes the angle of almost, okay, this is what happened in a, in a basic way, but it takes the perspective of Scott Fisher. It takes, yes. we are going and with- And a true crime perspective, looking at all the different yeah. uh, people involved. Yeah. The second one dives deeper, but it's going more on the, on, with adventure consultants and Rob Hall, it's more about his story. And obviously, his you story brush was shoulders, heartbreaking. Yeah, you brush shoulders again with the characters in the first book. But it's what once again is giving a different ride, a different perspective into the same story. And then Everest Three gives you another perspective this time through the guides Bidelman and Groom, who were the the sort of almost the not the guides, the chief guides, but the guides. So I think one of them was the chief guide. The other one was the, the junior guy. The, the junior guy. And so it was just looking at the approach and the experience. And, and anyway, by doing it that way, every time you get a more incisive experience of what is going on, you get a much clearer view. Each time the dive is deeper and more sort of surgical. And so the, the idea was that the, the fourth book would be from the Sherpa's perspective. And um, yeah, I haven't quite gotten to that yet. The idea I was hope just to, someday. Yeah, the idea was. I just, love them. Yeah, the guy. The idea wasn't just to do the ride up Everest again through the Sherpas. It was also to get a more, a little bit of a cerebral sense of um, what is it like to be a Sherpa. What spirit do you have? What What's that experience like of life? What is What is including kind of away from the mountain what is going on and so, it's a way of life for them yeah. that is their life up and down the and, and yeah, these... yeah. No, no, and like if you think of it in a basic way if you, if you think okay you you get this corporate chap you know a banker or whatever and he and i think there was quite a wealthy banker on um john krakauer's team um I know one guy was quite a wealthy, um, I think he, he worked in banking. I'm not sure if he actually made, wasn't it? Um, a, a, it was a father and son uh, duo and, and the one didn't make it or something like that. One didn't make it to the top. He, he still got into trouble in base camp. Anyway, um, but I believe there was a banker that was involved. But if you think of just from the, the point of view of, you've got somebody from the, 
corporate strata in a privileged life. And, and, and Everest is almost like, well, you, you, you pay for, you pay for Everest kind of thing. You know, I'll, I'll give you a lot of money and you'll get me up Everest, right? You know what I mean? It's almost like this very mercenary thing. You know, I'll, I will come here with all my money and all my equipment. I'll stay in a good hotel and, and I'll have all, everything I need and I'll get up to, to Everest, right? If you compare that to a Sherpa who starts off with nothing and he, you know, um, maybe doesn't even have money for shoes or something. And then he eventually climbs Everest 21 times. You know, you just compare that um, mental toughness and also, you know, it's, it's cobbling together something from nothing. And, and the mountain becomes something else. It becomes like a monument to, I've built my life around this mountain, whereas, yeah. whereas um, someone, someone from the West, it's, a, it's like a roller coaster ride. It's a one-off experience. And for, for these Sherpas, it's something that has given them the entire you know, the, the, the house that they've got in Kathmandu, or wherever, the they bought that from climbing this mountain over again. And they, they, I would imagine, have a deep love for it, where, you know, this, this is giving them their lifeblood, climbing. The respect. Is yeah, yeah. And, you know, and so, you know, in a way, I think they have a, a much deeper affinity for it, but at the same time, they can look at the situation and go, this is what needs to happen. Whereas the guy with the bucks is going, what are you talking about? Right. No, no, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to go up. Yeah, we're going to do this and you go. I, I paid floor. you. We're gonna, you're going to take me up. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, but, you but might they, not come back down. <laughs> yeah, so, so and, and literally they look at this and from their somewhat simpler circumstances, they tend to be right and they live to fight another day. Whereas these rich assholes um, can not come off the mountain kind of thing, you know? A unique perspective uh, that's a little bit different than the, the money with say the banker and the Sherpa is that on the, during this particular disaster, there were a number of doctors. And if you mm. think about their philosophy to save lives, it, it's almost th their their thinking became to, to vote to choose not to save people. Mm. These these doctors whose their their life their livelihoods off the mountain, their mindset to save people, but on the mountain, those same doctors were the ones who didn't lift a finger to help anybody. So that was well, kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that um crazy is you know this thing where people come down and they've lost their fingers or toes or something and it's like literally it's literally okay i'm not doing very great but i'm so close to this thing that i really want you know i think it's actually worth not having yeah. my thumb for the rest of my life or, or not half of your hand. face being frozen off or losing all my toes and and, and uh, this is the other side where you see Everest is kind of um, uh, awakening mental illness, literally, in some people, where they've climbed the mountain before and they've lost two toes, they come back and they lose another three, and then on their very last attempt, they get it right, but they lose all of their toes, and, and there are stories like that, there are stories about these guys who just keep coming back, they, they've got to do it, and some of them have already climbed Everest, but now that they're back to to climb it again because that other guy also has climbed it five times or whatever and so so you even have that aspect of you've now done this thing that's that is quite exceptional but now you've got to do it again because that's how amazing you are and that, so it's not even enough to climb Everest once you know and but I'm just saying but now each time you lose a body part you lose a finger and then a toe and then you kind of got to say cheapest when is it enough yeah. you know and I, I think the answer is in that part of the psychology, it's never enough because what's going on is it's about narcissism. It's like, how many likes on Facebook is enough? The answer is, it's never enough. Wow, well, I've got a million likes. I wonder if I can get 2 million. Wow, well, I've got 5 million likes. I wonder if I can get 50 million. 
you know and i'm i'm in that same cycle on youtube you know when i when i got i think a thousand views in my first video it was like wow a thousand views then, then you get ten thousand, and then it becomes i wonder if i can get 15 and then the answer is it's never enough and the only way to interrogate that is to look at yourself and say um it's never enough but actually it's enough you know mm -hmm. what i mean you've actually got to say you've got actually got to stop yourself and say it's enough it's not you enough it, but you've got to you, you've got to stop yourself and say um is this who i want to be do you want to do i want to be caught on this roller coaster like chris watts was i mean that's what he described that thing that he was on where he ended up killing somebody killing his whole family and say i think this is enough i think this is enough and as i said the answer is it's never enough until you are your own parent and you say I don't like what's happening here. I can see what's happening. I can see where it's going. Is this what you're going to do? And that's you when, yeah. You mentioned something um, that people experience as a summit fever. Do you think that it's when they get that feeling that it's something like a high that they want to reach again? I think quite a few things are happening when that's going on. I think some of it is you are not all there so you're compromised you are you're a little bit delirious you must remember when it's not like you climb everest you are striding right, like in altitude this, and all different factors playing yeah, in with it's mind. not like these soldiers marching off to war and, and they're marching you know it's this very plodding thing that becomes slower and slower and, and you, you become more and more isolated inside your little cocoon you know you, you're not even breathing the air anymore you're breathing the oxygen and so i think the summit fever becomes it's a combination i think of of where your fatigue um lends itself to in a way delusion but but also where you, you, you it's like wishful thinking kind of thing but it's not only that that's happening it's also the people around you start stirring and they start shifting and you know maybe they are not only aware of their own mortality but they becoming aware of the immortality. They're thinking that the summit's right there. You know, I've been sleeping for two or 3,000 steps. I've, I've kind of been like the zombie. And then you come alive again. It's like, the summit's right there. And there's no, nothing's going to stand in my way. It's, it's right there. You can there. see it. You can see it. Yeah, and so you get caught up in that. And so does the guy right next to you. And so you kind of get caught up in this, this wave. And you all want to go with that wave. Um, the other thing is just, it's just completely irrational in a situation where you've been working for weeks and you've paid so much money, where, where the summit is literally just over there, just, literally just over there. But unfortunately, on Everest, just over there could still be about an hour away, and that can cost you your life. So. That and old then thing, all the way down. Yeah, and that whole thing kind of works against you is where you, you're sort of thinking it makes sense to go just that little bit further because that's all I need to do, but that can cost you your life. And that's where you kind of need to say, um, is it worth it? And, and I don't think a lot of people have got that. You can say it at, the, at base camp. You can say, yes, if I'm in that situation, I will turn around. But probably... A lot of people in that situation will just say, there's no way I've come this far. Yeah. And I think there's even a conscious thing of, if I'm going to die, that's fine. You know, I'm prepared to die. That's kind of what Rob, Rob Hall did. He, yeah. he, he's, he must have known at some point, I'm not going to be coming back down. He even had the, the ability to, he was radioing his, uh, I think very pregnant wife, mm -hmm. knowing that he was going to die in the mountain. And I think some of it was, he felt like it was more dignified for him to lose his life on the mountain and stay with his mm -hmm. uh, clients at, or, and his friend. Mm -hmm. He had lost um, Doug Hansen. But, and it, it seemed like he got a bit delirious towards the end that, that he was at the end i think he did mm. i think he didn't yeah i think he definitely need, they need more oxygen 
mm. is something that they needed to. Um, and the cold. It, it, it feels a little bit like Scott Fisher got summit fever, but, but not even when he was near the summit. I'm talking about, you know, he was determined to go to the summit and he was actually quite sick. It was like he was already coughing when he was, I think, going through the Kumbu icefall. But you kind of got the sense that he, no matter what, he was going to make sure he got to the summit. And he didn't really need to because I think didn't all of his clients get to the summit. And, and I know a number of the mountain um, madness team did, did make it. And I think that that was also something that was weighing on Robert Hall's mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. It's like, I got to get this one guy up. He yeah. knew this guy yeah. came down sick, this one. You know, mm -hmm. A lot of his team didn't make it. And he has the, these, this journalist who's going to write a story about this. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about K2. Um, I must say that story caught me completely by surprise. I was like, wow, there's a K2 disaster. And I think it happened in 2000. Yeah, me so, too. When I, when I finished the Neverest, yeah. the three books, I was like, wait, there's a K2? What is this K2? Mm -hmm. And then and you I must say when I, when I started writing about that, I thought this this is possibly going to be a book that gets three chapters and then and then trickles into nothing, you know, because I was like, I don't know anything about K2 and K2 is quite a technical climb. And, you know, I'm quite familiar with Everest just from watching so many documentaries and I know about the Hillary step and I know about the Kumbu Icefall and I know this and I know that. I've got a kind of a sense of it. And there, there's so many books about Everest as well. But K2, I was like, wow, you know, this is a mountain I don't know. Um, and what was incredible was getting to know the mountain, getting to know the um, that very um, difficult area. Right. Yeah. Um, but there's like an area where there's a huge cornice of, of snow. You need to get the Ciroc, through this. I don't know how to say it's Ciroc. Ciroc. Yeah, but you, you kind of need to get through this very narrow channel and then move to the, 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 the side because that particular area is so susceptible to avalanches and that is where a couple of the climbers did, did succumb. The other thing that is, um, I'm not saying it's not a fact on Everest because it can be, but what is totally a different level on K2 is you climbing at night and mm -hmm. you on like an ice wall so it's right dark. it's very vertical yeah right? it's vertical it's yeah. frozen and you you know you're like in the dark and you can be as scared or as not scared as you want to be you know because there you are you're in this little cocoon of of light or whatever but you are hanging on like a, a wall of ice and there's a chasm below you and and you put yourself there kind of thing and um it's not just well get yourself down it's also every now and then things fall from above whether it's rocks or, or ice or avalanches or bodies and it just makes the whole story it just takes it to a level that is pretty crazy and one of the um things that i remember from writing k2 that that was just very heartbreaking i mean if if Rob Hall talking to his pregnant wife. I very think, moving. That book was yeah. a very moving narrative. Yeah. Um, it brought me to tears a couple of times because it, you, you really got us to know the people, the climbers. Uh, they you weren't mean just. You too? No, no, K2. K2, yeah. Yeah, K2. well, I think K2, what does that is there are, there's that couple that, that are, so um, they're such a beautiful couple, and they're such they seem Ralph, like Ralph, Ralph and Cecily. Yeah, from Denmark, right? Yeah. And and then Joe from Ireland, and they're, they're just such nice people. You know, when you come, I don't want to be nasty, but when you compare that group to the folks going up Everest, they're you kind of get a sense. Yeah, I mean the 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 group going up K two were younger and just seemed like they should have been there. Whereas when you when you go through the Everest story thinking, 
you shouldn't be there, you shouldn't be there, you shouldn't be there, you definitely shouldn't be there. Whereas on KT, you're thinking, well, these are a, a really nice group of people. You, you feel quite inspired by them because they brave, they strong, they, some of them are quite beautiful people. They are um, good, they've got great spirit and, and everything. And obviously when you climb K2, it's, it's in a way a much greater achievement than Everest. It doesn't have the commercial thing to it. No. Um, it's far more a personal story. And of course, what I didn't expect with K2 was, okay, well, once again, you've got somebody who is reporting everything and now it's creating this strange like ghost that is hanging over people's shoulders. Now, now I've got to play to the camera kind of thing. And when, when as soon as that happens, you, you're not quite fully concentrated or focused. And I think what it proved on K2 is just being a little bit distracted is deadly. And I must say, I've watched, have you, have you seen that uh, documentary? I think it's called I think it's called something like Free Solo, where Alex Honnold climbs El Capitan. Have you seen that? I have not, but I have a bunch of climbing documentaries that I have saved yeah. because I'm now interested in watching them. But in 1996, where you had these reporters, photojournalists, now you're in 2008, and you've got just these ev everyday or you know, seasoned climbers with their cell phones. Absolutely, it's yeah. Now it's got a totally different dimension. Um, someone's just died now, um, a Spanish Let guy. me get this documented, right? Yeah. Someone's let just me, died let now. Let me film them rescuing. Yeah, yeah. Um, a Spanish guy's just died on K2 where he, he'd filmed everything kind of, not everything, but a lot on, I think for Instagram. And, but I mean, that's happening now as a matter of course, is people climb right. and now there's all things going on, you know. Um, anyway, the, the thing that for me was just heartbreaking in its, in its, um, in that, in that visual, um, and it, it's funny how certain things stick with you, um, but there's a, I think you know what I'm talking about, I'm not going into too much detail, but the, someone fell on K2 in the story and they found the, the, the body, I think bodies, there were two people and you actually see photos and it is just- it Sticks with you, it's in here. Yeah, no, it is, you, you realize this is, this is hardcore, Real. this is not, yeah. this is not fiddlesticks. And, you know, again, if you take the true crime thing, not, not that anything in true crime is, a picnic you know death is death and and it's none of it is okay and none of it is you know um acceptable or whatever but when you see some of the stuff you know you should bear in mind when you climb a mountain if you die of a fall you're literally dying of impact injuries and you you, you don't die in one or two seconds it can be quite a horrible agonizing death and, and, and that actually brings us to the, the last book in the series Uli and um, you that, met him or not met him but you I think it's I'm he's not here anymore you spoke with him you know I mean when when he died I, I actually felt this terrible sadness but beyond that like um, the feeling I had when I spoke to him, when I thought about him. So sometimes I would have a conversation with him and uh, that conversation would just stay in my mind for, for that, that day. Sometimes it would linger for, for a lot longer. But uh, you kind of had this sense of there's someone in this world who's this, this incredible spirit. There's someone in this world who's, who's living this incredible life. This, you know, he's jumping through mountains it's almost a feeling that superman exists in the world yeah, the, yeah. he's invincible yeah but but there's this incredible person that that is part of the the human population right now and and, and he's going off on many different adventures and there was something yeah. really inspiring about that 
every time you spoke to him, you got a sense of what the F have, have I done today? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> really, you, you'd talk to him and you'd be like, I'm... Like he's on his way to do this or he yeah. just did that. <laughs> and, and you kind of had a sense of private shame or private embarrassment or private, like, wow, what am you know, I, I could be doing so much more. I, you know, I should be outside more, whatever it is, because you just got the sense that this guy was out there it, literally living. living life to the absolute full. You, you couldn't live it more to the full than he was. He was feeling the wind on his face. He was all around the world. Um, you know, he was just living this incredible life. And you know, it, it couldn't be effortless. Yeah, and it couldn't be more kind of like a, a perfect postcard because he, he was from Switzerland. So it's, it's that whole mountain goats thing and, and you know, like Heidi and everything. And and um, I don't know, it was just quite magical. And, and I certainly got quite caught up in it. And um, uh, I must say, um, you, you're going to laugh when I say this, but initially we didn't get along very well. And I think um, I'm quite a, not a stubborn person, but I, I've got quite a clear idea of what I want to do or how I want to do something. And I was quite surprised that he was, probably a lot more like that. So when we were going to, we were talking more about like a free spirit, whereas you were more like wanting to have specific time and date, like you wanted, wanted to chat or I think I'm also a, a free spirit as a freelancer. And a, I've also lived a fairly, um, That's true. but, but what I mean is, um, I think sometimes, you know, you have an idea in your mind of this works for me. And you think, well, someone else will just go along with it. And, and he didn't. And there was almost this moment of, okay, goodbye from both of us. You know, like, because first of all, I couldn't understand him that well. You know, I, I would say so. His, his English wasn't that good, was it? No, it wasn't, or wasn't that good. Um, from, from the videos I've seen where he's speaking and giving uh, some presentations in, it, it, it was hard to understand. Yeah. So that would be a... To be honest, right in the beginning, I thought, is this guy for real? Like, does he want me to write his book? Does, has he read any of my books? Does he know who I am? You know, what is going on? You know, why doesn't he get someone from Germany or, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. And, and so another part of me was wondering, are you doing, I was just wondering, but I was wondering, are you doing this to improve your English? Are you doing this? Because one of the things I said to him was, and the only reason I did it was that was I, had the exact same experience with somebody else. So um, I was going to write a book about the world champion South African swimmer. He'd been to the Olympics, I think, four times. And I have a background in swimming. I was a, a provincial swimmer. Uh, I swam with a swimmer who eventually went to the Olympics, but I kind of know about it quite well. And um, so I was going to write his story, and but he didn't have a lot of time. So and he was also in the states. I think he was in Arizona, and so what we decided was, if I'm not available, he'll leave a, like a voice message on WhatsApp, and then I'll find questions out of that, and I'll then leave him a message. We, we'll have some um sort of direct communication but some of it will be recorded and whatever and eventually you'll put a narrative together and whatever and so i wanted to do that with uli the whole idea was if you're not available then you just respond in your own time giving your own story whatever and uli wasn't interested in that so he wanted to converse yeah he wanted to have a conversation and he also it wasn't like so he wanted us to be available at the same time mm -hmm. and and that, that's why I found that a little bit funny because it was like I would be talking to him on his way back from the airport from having climbed it's kind somewhere. of nice though it's it's yeah yeah real you know you're... yeah so but I'm all I'm saying is I almost torpedoed the whole thing and said look dude you do it your way I'm gonna do it my way whatever and so we almost didn't do anything and then it's hard um, for your schedules to align probably with your yeah, both very busy. 
I, I definitely found like, because I actually thought I would prefer a recording of him so that I can actually figure out what he's saying. Because often when he did talk to me, at the end of it, I'd be like, I'd look at my notes and I'd be like, I couldn't hear what he said there. I couldn't hear what he said there. And mm -hmm. um, um, I mean, you know, you can record it on something else, but I would have wanted a, you know, him giving his story from start to finish rather than, rather than a conversation. But the fact that we did have these conversations meant um, that it was quite conversational and that I got quite caught up in what he was doing and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. And I didn't expect the story to go the way it did. And, and I'm, in, a, in a way, I feel almost embarrassed or I feel, I, I would say shame, but I feel I'm not very happy with the way the story went, but I'm afraid if I go into a story, I'm going to report on it. You know what I mean? And so dealing with the, um, and Aparna, I was quite shocked that things seemed the way that they seemed. I won't talk too much about that here, but that definitely shocked me. And, and then um, it's very difficult to say what happened in his last moments, but I, I can't help feeling that that the whole negative publicity about Annapurna and the doubt that, that, that happened there, I can't help but think that that was weighing in on him at that time. I could be completely wrong. It could also just be a complete freak thing where he, he, he stepped on a piece of ice or, or, or something, but I've got a feeling that that, that that was, you know, I just don't think accidents just happen. And, you know, they can just happen in the mountains, but it's just a gut feeling that, that I think that was weighing on him at the time. And I must say, when I, when I, when I heard that he died, you know, um, I don't know, you know, I had, I still got his WhatsApp on my phone. I've still got his picture on my phone. It just doesn't seem real. And it shows you to what extent, even if you're aware that fairy tales aren't real, you are susceptible to them. You, it's almost like we need fairy tales to live better or to lift ourselves. Mm -hmm. but at the same time, you've got to be very wary that fairy tales are pulling you away from reality. Yeah. And gravity is going to pull you back no matter what, yeah. you know. I think that your book really did did the person that he is and was justice. I think that you shared your sharing his story allowed me to get to know him authentically and it being not very long ago that this had happened, I mm. think 2017 he passed. <clears throat> so many of the hyperlinks that you've included in the book, the video that document his journey, uh, along with your transcripts of your conversations, they're all there still. Mm. It's not like, you know what I mean? Like, so I, you are li literally living in the moment, his story, mm. and it's all there still. And it was really very, very moving. You feel you got to know him. This man who is younger than I am uh, came yeah, to- he died at 40 years old. Yeah, he was really- Yeah, he was only 40 years old. Yeah. And uh, it was like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what what is so sad about the whole thing is he was about to do something magnificent. He was about to do that, I um, can't even remember the name, something hornbound. It was circuit. like a horse. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I forget what yeah. And, and it, it's a, I guess it's probably a really bad example, but it's a little bit like Lance Armstrong riding the Tour de France. You, mm -hmm. you, you really got caught up in the... In the in the in the sense of mission and the, the legend in the making kind of thing, and, and so he was about to do something absolutely incredible, and then inexplicably lost his life. You know, he was about to do something awesome, and everyone was waiting for that to happen. And it was going to be this this incredible. Um, you know, even for me, writing about his story, I was like, "Wow, this is 
going to be great for me as well. You know, this is going to be a good conclusion to his story. You know, if if, if Annapurna is that is, chapter of his life. You no, know, if, if Annapurna is the sort of little murky area and we're not quite sure what happened, this was going to be the shining triumph. And then it was the opposite, you know. Yes. So of the five books, how would you rate them? Like which one did you enjoy the most from the first to the last? Of the five? <laughs> of the five altogether? Um, I really loved the last three. Okay. I really did. I and and in different ways. Like I really loved just Yuli's story. Mm -hmm. And I loved that all the hyperlinks and all the information, I really felt like I got to know him and his story and now his legacy. Mm -hmm. With K2, I still felt that way. I think maybe because it was more focused on some specific stories and there was a lot less different, Love. I don't want to say characters, climbers involved. Yeah, It was easier to get to know them I think what and makes I Everest complicated is too. you've got these two huge expeditions. Yeah. You know, it's not just one group. And because they're two, it's difficult to, to say, well, this is the story. Because And especially if you, I mean, if you are Krakauer or Beck Weathers or whatever, then you tell it obviously from the perspective of your expedition. But if you, me, you've kind of got to say, okay, well, what, where, what do you, who do you go with? Which climate do you run with? to this section. And so that does make it, and, and when you say that the last three narratives were your, your, the favorites for you, what makes me wonder is, did I, did I become a better writer? So in other words, um, you know what I mean? Did I, yeah, did yeah, the I writing know. improve um, to, from the first to the second, to the third, to the fourth, to the fifth? That could be a part of it, unknowing, you know, it could, Definitely yeah. be a part of it. I, but there were so many names that even in the in the Neverest and Neverest Two, the stories that I were drawn to, were, the ones that, obviously, were told, more in depth. Like Robert Hall, I fell in love with him mm -hmm. as a as the character, the person that he he is and was, and I, I just love I was an elementary school teacher before I stayed home with my children. So the little part about Doug Hansen and the children resonated with me, mm. you know, so there are different reasons for the different stories. I think the climate that, that, that meant the most to me, aside from Uli, in terms of the, the Neverest saga is Anatolia. I just, I just, I really, um admired his humility his work ethic um i think when i look at him I, I i hope that i'm somewhat like him you know where you you you, you there's no there's no bull bull x you know what i mean it's just you know what i mean you you do the work and you get mm -hmm. the job done and um and it's not about appearances it's about you know th that other thing and also, he, he, he wasn't... It was about people for him. It yeah, was about the people. Yeah, yeah and, and he, he wasn't sort of pushed into corner. He could also fight for himself. And, and so, yeah, I kind of um, found him to be like the real deal. You know, of everybody, he, he was really like the real deal. And it's almost like what the way that he died almost shows that as well. Um, yeah unfortunately but yeah and he was one of the ones who went back to namba and made a memorial around no, the time body that was incredibly touching you know there's a part of you i think He's when acknowledging you, i you know, i wasn't able to save you and this well, is, there was a there was a you know when you when you read the climb and when you follow his story, there's sort of a moment here and there where you, where you think, does this guy have any emotions? Because he's like a machine. And he's like mm -hmm. so super strong. And then for him to... Just doing what he does. Yeah. And but just because he's such an incredibly strong guy, but it sort of crosses your mind, 
does this guy actually, is he like a Terminator? You know, like what's going on here, you know? And then the way that he did that with number was like, you must want to start your high. Yeah, and no, it's just like, it's almost like um, Clint Eastwood does his thing and then, um, you know, um, I don't know, I, I, I guess he says to somebody, um, do you want to get married? You know, it's like, wow, he actually, he does something, he does have a life beyond that. There's another part of him. Yeah. Um, but I must say that was, that was pretty, you, you've got to feel for Yasuka Namba, you've got to feel for her because of every, of everyone, her death seemed the most unnecessary. Agonizing too. Yeah, it just seemed like it's literally you, you're lying in the ice just over there and there's a whole group of people in the tent that are too self-involved to give a crap. And she pleaded with them too. Don't yeah, leave me alone. Yeah. Don't let me die here. I mean, that, 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 that part of the saga where there's this huddle of people and just go together to where you need to go. And, you know, I, um, I don't know whether it, it touches me because I lived in South Korea for a couple of years and you, you, you do get a sense of the, the Asians can be quite quiet. Sometimes they can be quite, um, there was a language barrier, you know, I think there was some kind of barrier with her too, because yeah. they said that not only they took off her mask and she was fighting to keep it on. And I think she was trying to tell them, this is keeping my face insulated. Please mm. don't do that. And then they mm -hmm. took that off and then they still left her. It was. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think when you have a situation like that, where you've got a group of people, it's almost like, um, um, do you know, you know that story? Um, I can't quite think of the, the Lord of the Flies. Did not actually reference that in Neverus, Lord of the Flies. I, but, I, but anyway, with, with Lord of the Flies, you have the situation of the, you know, it's obviously children, but you have this group of people in a, in a wild setting so that they're not constrained by the rules of society, but they come from the rules of society. And what happens is they form cliques of order and disorder. And, mm -hmm. and then in, in the, you, you, are you familiar with Lord of the Flies? No, no. So, so um, basically. But I can this, see how that was happening, how you could compare that. Yeah, you have this group that becomes, you know, they, they kind of go, become like wild animals. And then you get, have the small other group that are sensible and sensitive, but they're outnumbered. And and then they, and then the, the 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 wild group almost like if you almost want to imagine the Vikings, and the and plundering. Um, so for, there was this little boy called Piggy who had glasses, and they used his glasses to make fire. But now bear in mind, Piggy needs his glasses because he's a little boy that needs his glasses. But the other boys need his glasses so they can use the lens to make fire, right? Like a magnifying glass. Right. And so it becomes this thing where they don't care about what he wants, they want the glasses. Whereas if you could just all live together, then use the glasses when you need it. And when you don't need it, Piggy can use his glasses kind of thing, you know? And so anyway, you have this group forming of the wild animals, people becoming like wild animals, and then the smaller civilized group that are sensible and they, they, they find certain things out, but they're outnumbered. And so I think that's what happened on Everest, which is like, we could help you, but we'd rather help ourselves. And besides, you're not really like us and you're outnumbered. So you're on your own and I'm going to back myself with this group kind of thing. But, but don't worry, when you come back down from the mountain, then we're going to say, no, 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 we were the civilized group. We were the nice people. I don't know what happened there. You know, that, that's that story. She, you made um, a point that she was nearly <laughs> so close that they could have almost made like a human chain yeah to yeah. try to reach her and they yeah. didn't yeah they i didn't mean try instead they voted to leave her it's so sad that anatoly you know he'd gone out i think twice 
if you just go like one more time, your life would have been saved. And that is literally what ate him up. That's why he went back up. Was mm. was that that sense, you know, of yeah. But he literally couldn't go that one more time. He didn't even have enough oxygen to do mm. that. So if he had had one, like crowd prayer had helped or someone had joined, they all, mm. it, she, her life didn't have to end that day. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if I could, I wanted to ask you how uh, your father and your brother and you got into the, to, to climb the mountain what was your motivations is that something your father had done and you've known about or some an experience you want to share together what led you to what was um, your motivation to climb well my father's quite a like he, he looks a bit like sean connery he's got that look about him um, yeah i'd seen him on the game farm yeah. um videos um, you shared but he's also a very um it's kind of got that camel manness about him where where he likes doing very manly stuff like white river rafting and big game fishing and climbing mountains and and all that kind of thing even even as as an older guy so it's not like okay i'm now an old guy i'm gonna sit in my rocking chair i mean he's um he's almost Did 80. He part of a running club with you or or not um, he's not part of the running club, but he, a, oh, a, a school okay. friend of his was. Oh, okay. But um, I get the impression that he's very active. Yeah, so so he's got a farm, and he will plow the farm himself. You know, like plow the you know, it's not it's not with a combined harvester like on the prairie. It's it's like a oldish tractor, and you've got to you know pull the implements together and Labor. whatever. Yeah, and I mean um, he's. Uh, 79 years old he's turning 80 this year and oh. he doesn't look 80 he looks maybe 70 no, he and he um he's very yeah he's very active he's got a girlfriend he's um so so i think if i remember correctly um what happened was a friend of his said the mountain climbing club of south africa is going to climb kilimanjaro um so many people cancel, do you want to take their place kind of thing. That's literally how it happened. So the mountain climbing club had, had organized everything, you know, they, they knew what was going on and all we had to do was put our names on the form kind of thing. And so, so he was going to go with his pal and he was like, well, do you guys want to go? And at that time I was a um, pretty high level yeah. triathlete. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was just, you know, for me, it was just a little bit of exercise and, and you know, it'll be was quite Was there an article written about your reaching Yeah, that I wasn't, <laughs> I ended up, so talking about hubris and all that kind of thing, I ended up on I was going to ask you, how did that feel? I've seen the, and, and you mentioned that an article was written, right? Yeah, I would just say I feel quite embarrassed about it. And I'll tell you Aww. why. No, because... So, so the, 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 the headline of the article was, I won't, I won't say it verbatim, but it was basically mm -hmm. the first university student of this university to climb Kilimanjaro. And I mean, it, might, it may have been true, but I don't think I thought about that when I, for me, it was just- When it was happening. I think when I, when I um, spoke to the reporter, I think what was going on in my mind was I thought this photo of me and the guide, the guide was um, a Tanzanian. Yeah. And I thought it's quite a nice photo. It's like solidarity, you know. I think you shared it in one of the books, actually. I think that's where I might have seen it. Yeah, and I just thought that's quite a nice photo kind of for South Africa at that time as well. The, you know, this guy and that guy on the top of yeah. Africa and yeah, we are, whatever. And... I don't think I expected them to, to sort of say, this is the first university student to ever climb Kilimanjaro. I actually didn't know that I was, but um, yeah, I felt a little bit embarrassed. And what is quite funny with that, it just shows you how you can get caught up in it. I, I was sort of scared to go outside because I thought everyone's going to recognize I was going to say, were you like a celebrity? <laughs> a little well, bit of a celebrity? I, yeah, I, I kind of imagined that. that was On the campus? Crazy. 
I don't think anybody recognized me. I don't remember anyone saying, oh, I saw you on the, on the front page. I, no, not a single person came up to me, but I think for the first two, three days, I was like, you know. <laughs> well, it's, it's a really nice picture. It's a, it's a good memory. And it's you, not- You know the story behind that picture that when the guy tried to take the photo, it didn't, you know, the camera went dead. Do you know the story? I don't. I don't know that I remember. I, I don't think so. So, so I was. I think that was just before my photojournalism days, but shows you where I was going in my mind. I actually had my father's camera, so I was carrying this um, Canon or a Pentax or something. And when I posed for the photo, um, the guy that was taking it who was my a friend of my father's. He's actually recovering from coronavirus right now. This guy is a. Oh professor of architecture or something. Anyway, um, so I'd give him the, the camera and, and in the time that he would take to to put me in the frame and, and snap the photo, the, the battery would die. And then he'd oh. say, oh, there's something wrong with the camera. Then I'd take it back and I'd turn it off, turn <laughs> it on again and the battery would come on. I'd give it back <laughs> to him and then he'd do the same thing again. And I'm like, okay, just faster. And then, it, and then he would he say something's wrong with this camera. I contact the photo. And he got photo, a good photo. How did he get that good photo then? No, no, no it probably happened five times. And then I eventually said to him, "Listen, yeah, just yeah, you have it. Now just get the settings <laughs> right, and all you must do is just hit the button. That's all." And but the the the, the thing that I think is quite ironic with that is, um, yeah, you are on the top of the mountain. And there's this crisis. Oh, can you take this photo? Can you take it in a split second? Because if you don't have a summit photo, you can climb the mountain. Kind of thing. <laughs> right. Thing of, every time I give him the camera, the battery goes because it's it's just so cold, and he oh just cannot God. get it right. And I was like starting to think, this is no, you know. Oh. And eventually, eventually, he did he did take it, but it, it was like looking. That's at, funny now, right? Yeah, I mean, now it's looking like it's not going to happen. This guy is just not, it's not going to happen. And then eventually did, yeah. So that, that definitely was quite funny. But it, it is interesting that feeling you get. So can you just take a photo of me on the summit of this mountain? Oh, no, I actually can't take the photo. And it's like, oh, shit. Right. <laughs> this, is, we, this is a disaster. Need to make this, this needs to happen. This is a big disaster, you know. <laughs> So yeah, this, it does show you. Yeah. You had your, your photo, you made it down, yeah. but it wasn't easy from, I, I really hope that um, some other patrons or followers will read this, the narratives because uh, there's a lot of good information in there, not only about the journeys of the different people on that expedition, but your own Mm. And also some that your father had shared. It was really, yeah. it was a really, it was a great series. And I'm sad that they're over for now. So I do hope maybe this 25 year will inspire you to maybe knock another one out someday. Yeah, I mean, if I'm going to write another one, I need to write it maybe in April. So, but we'll see. I've got this um, finding writing very harder than ever. I think it's... Um, you know, I think I'm done with writing for a while. I need a proper long break. I actually need to get away from computers and everything, and then I can come back and write. But I'm, I feel like really done. I feel very maybe not to the Himalayas because that scares me for you. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> I, I, I'm afraid. I would be afraid we'd lose you or something. <laughs> uh, uh, something that I didn't mention was. Over and over and over again, when I spoke to Uli, I wanted to say to him, do just, can you just stop? Can you stop what you're doing? Because you're going to die. And he, he would talk about these things. And I really wanted to just like, almost like give him a hug and just say, dude, just, can you just stop? Just do something a little bit less risky. He and, was almost there, I think, in his mindset. He was almost there. and Yeah, but I kind of also I felt... To say that to him, I'm, I'm, I'm handing over my fear to him and it's going to give him the heebie-jeebies in a situation like that. But, you know, if you've, if you've ever watched Free Solo, where Alex Arnold is climbing El Capitan, you know, 
at any moment he could have slipped and fell. And when you've got the, the drone hanging over him and a photographer, your if your concentration's one percent off at that moment, and, and why wouldn't it be one percent off when the photographer's right there on that part of the climb or a drone yeah, is hovering right over your shoulder and, and it's actually irritating or the wind's blowing against you, whatever. So there were quite a few times I wanted to say to him, um, and I, I think I did say to him at least once, but you know. Just, just, you know, um, you can lose your life, dude, you know. And um, anyway, on Kilimanjaro, um, when I went to climb Kilimanjaro, I still had that romance of the high mountains. I still had a very strong feeling of wanting to go to the, the Himalayas and, and climb. And, and, and Kilimanjaro cured that for me. Um, when I was on Kilimanjaro, I was like, what the F am I actually doing here? there were moments where I was walking and there was the stupendous scenery around me, like the, the, yeah. these incredible scenes. And I was like, I don't really care. I've got a pounding headache. I'm cold. I'm dehydrated. Um, there were some unfortunate events that happened on the climb. Like, um, although something was supposed to be arranged, we didn't, my brother and I actually weren't given um, like a shelter to stay in on the night of the final summit it was we were supposed to be in like a cabin and they, they just said it's full so we actually had to sit out in the cold kind of in a makeshift tent and it wasn't a very nice way to um spend those hours before being in the cold for like the rest dress, of that night yeah. yeah and so anyway i'm just saying i found it quite a miserable experience so it was just really miserable and i thought you know so if you're in a tent and it's there's just frost everywhere and the wind's buffering around and you three kilometers higher than that, how much less are you going to care about where you are? You know? And yeah, there um, were a lot of unglamorous things about the, your experience and the experience of the climbers that yeah. you learn more about reading. I mean, I, I, I do love the idea of um, geography and I'd love to go to Iceland. I've got the world map above my computer here. And I'd love to go to the Himalayas and just see those mountains. I don't know if you've always got to climb them. Right. Uh, but th there's a part of you that obviously thinks, how would I do without oxygen, like 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 these really good climbers like Bo Creep, how would I handle that? And there's a part of you that thinks, you know, what if I dedicated my life just to climbing? You know, would I be like this climbing legend or whatever? And another part of you thinks, you know, um, yeah, well, you could have, ended up like some of these other climbers. Mm -hmm. At this point, there's not much of an appeal to me of climbing Everest because you, you just see this, these really, really long lines and there doesn't seem to be, it seems to be more like foolish. And, yeah, I mean, to me, um, rather than climbing Everest, I'd like to climb a peak that's high, but obscure so that you get yeah. that experience with nature. you and the mountain, not you and a crowd of people, not you and all these narcissists, you know, on social media. So, yeah. yeah. There, there's um, quite a lot of footage showing these days, climbers doing that, waiting there in line, yeah, freezing, yeah. just standing and, just and stepping over a body. And yeah, they're just, even like, oh, there's a body. And they step over it. Yeah. It's like- That's not only that, it's, it's on a line, you, you, you're roped in, you just step, step into the footprint of the guy in front of you. When you get to the Hillary step, there's a ladder. I mean, what part of it, it's, it's just um, zombies in a line and then you take the sudden and come back and now you're a hero. It's just not, it's not real, so, you know. I also seen a lot of current event type uh, articles. Now, I don't know, I guess, because my social media knows I'm, I've been interested in this that it's showing like, oh, here's an article from like two days ago. We're making art out of the trash from Everest because it's filled with garbage. Like that was one of the articles that was sent to me just a couple of days ago. I mean, yeah, it's also just- the amount of excrement that's on Everest. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say the load of so crap. <laughs> something that I've thought about and I'm still thinking about something that my father also mentioned was climbing Aconcagua, which is slightly bigger than, slightly taller than Kilimanjaro. It's in South America. And 
but when you read through the the website and the whole thing one of the requirements is you need to carry your excrement yeah and you mentioned and, you didn't want to do that again <laughs> yeah and i just thought i don't know if that could be a fun experience i don't know if i would come off the mountain like wouldn't your 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 memory of the mountain be of your own excrement yeah and i, I think that's quite a good analogy to climbing everest is a lot of people climbing it with the, who are full of excrement <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah no i agree <laughs> yeah okay so thanks a lot for uh chatting um i hope people have found this interesting i hope um some of you are going to read Neverest and K2 and Uli. Um, so Stephanie is obviously someone who's gotten to know me through the true crime thing. You, you've read, I think, all the Chris Watts books, some of the mm -hmm. Amanda Knox books, John Bernay Ramsey. And so I don't, I didn't even ask you. I think you were just curious. You're like, wow, what is this? And then you yeah, read I saw I saw the titles and I was like, e Mount e Everest, Mount Everest. Well, why is he writing about that? And then I was like, oh, this is so neat. Like, I want to read about this experience from a true crime perspective. And, I think, and then uh, I loving think, and respecting. I think to answer the question of why I wrote about it, I think I think when I wrote about it, it was quite early, fairly early in my writing. Uh, I think 2016 about, and I think what I was trying to do was um, get credibility to some extent. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, if I wrote about John Bernay Ramsey, it was like, this guy's self-published a book on John Bernay Ramsey, who, who's he? If I wrote a book on that, it was the same thing. Whereas with Neverest, I had a little bit of a different kind of expertise and that expertise was that I had kind of the endorsement of um, what, uh, what's his name, DeWalt, um, Western DeWalt of The Climb. He, he'd read a long form article I'd, I'd written and it said, this is the clearest exposition of the 96 disaster I've ever read or I've ever seen. And I, and I thought I could use that as a way to give me a little bit of credibility. And I also thought, let me write about something that I think I know something about and share my experiences and something that I, I'm interested in. And I think I can do a good job. That was really what, how I sort of approached it. And um, I, I was blown away because I, I, really, I, I really thought this is a huge gamble, but I was blown away by the initial interest in, in Everest. Um, there were a few not very good reviews at about the 60, 60 interview mark and then they the, the interest subsided a little bit but until then it, it was incredibly popular and what what i found quite interesting was there's a very different audience for that to true crime true crime seems to be mostly women and the mountaineering books are definitely mostly men and so it was quite interesting straddling both those universes because they are quite different um because you're talented <laughs> yeah i do think quite a few guys who are climbing mountains so the the people who are actually in the himalayas climbing mountains and they're stuck in their tents have got a candle with them or a phone with them or a tablet with them and they're like okay we stuck and i'm going to read about a book about climbing Everest. I'm on Everest or I'm on this mountain in the Himalayas and then they read my book. It's sort of showing what they're doing to be some sometimes uh, poorly motivated or whatever. And, and their heroes are now being invalidated one by one. You know what I mean? And I think that's not a very nice story when you're there. You know what I mean? Right. I think right. in that sense, it's like raining on their Just parade. Just like um, some of them sitting in the tents reading about the articles or the blogs being written about them mm. while they're on the i think that's far more fun that's like this is awesome you know and they, they don't really be reminded of the excrement <laughs> they wouldn't be <laughs> they wouldn't be reminded of they are awesome kind of thing that's yeah. i mean that's why they're there that's why they're there so but um 
in a very basic way, there's nothing wrong with the, the simple thing of, I want to go into the outdoors, I want to climb that high thing or this that peninsula that's jutting out into the sea. I want to go and see what that's like. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's the whole thing where you want to convince everyone else of what a hero you are in. It, it's that it's that sideshow to it. In other words, I'm no longer doing it because I'm curious or for me, I'm doing it to tell a story. And is that story going to be true, authentic? Is it going to be genuine or is the story going to be a lie? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you think about that thing where I was on the top of Kilimanjaro with a camera, there's something comical about it. There's, there's something comical about the desperation where, please, please make sure you get the, the photo and you look at the, the, the sort of steadfastness and the, the courage and the discipline to get to that point. And then when you're at that point, it becomes this comical joke kind of thing. You know, that, that's Begging. kind of what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, Stephanie, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit after I stop the recording, but I just want to say to you guys, you can find Neverest on Kindle. I think all five books are available on Kindle. I might make one or two of them available as audiobooks on Patreon in April, and then at the same time, bring one or two out in paperback. So look out for that. Um, I want you guys on Patreon to leave a comment about what you thought of our conversation, whether you think we should do it again. Also, if you'd like to participate next time, also, which books you want to talk about. So you can decide what the next book club books are going to be. Uh, it can be anything. It can be um, Amanda Knox. It can be Casey Anthony. It can be Chris Watts. It can be Jody Arias. It can be John Benet Ramsey. And then also, um, we can also talk about other books. So books that are... Um, I'm going to lean over and get a book here. Recommendations? Yeah, so books that I haven't written, by, perhaps by someone else. This is Educated by Tara Westover. This is a book that for me was an incredible read. And I think that this book is very insightful in terms of Laurie Vallow. So if you want to understand what is going on there from a, the perspective of just push all of this stuff aside and get into the, the psychology and the, the family life and all that stuff, then that's a really, really good book to read. So that's definitely something you guys can read and we can talk about. And uh, let's keep this. Keep, hmm? That on your true crime um, rocket science recommendations, because I think you have a tab for that. Yeah, so we can definitely agree on uh, which books we want to look at. I also want to do a thing where you don't necessarily, you don't have to have read a book or I don't have to have read the book that you're talking about. We can literally have a pile of books on our desk and we say, I read this book, I like this one, I recommend this one, this one, this one, this one. Just five minutes talking about a book and then somebody else does it. It doesn't have to be my books. It can, it can, and so it's just really about, because I love reading. And it's really just the true thing of a book club, which is, well, I found this book life-changing. I found it awesome. Uh, and maybe you will too. So, so I want to make the book club kind of about my books some of the time, but also just about a book that, or, or a series of books that, that were um, powerful and compelling and worth reading. So that's something maybe to look forward to. Yeah, I look forward to hearing other people's recommendations. I know we've been chatting for quite some time. I'll say for me, it flew. <laughs> yeah, how long have we been talking? I, I don't actually see it. I, I have almost two hours. Oh, okay. Okay. I think we, we so said, I don't know. If... I think we said off air, let's go for about one hour. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so um, thanks a lot for joining me in this pilot episode. Let's hope it does okay on YouTube. I don't know if, if it's going to be able to load up, but at least we've got the audio. And then this is episode one. And as I say, um, you, everyone else is 
invited you to participate. Uh, we've now figured out how Zoom works. So um, we can do another episode like this once or twice a month, and, and that, that will be form part of the TCRS book club. Uh, what, time, what time do you have it there in Connecticut? Uh, 10 of 8. Okay, so here it is 10 to 3 in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> I know. That's why. <laughs> no, but don't worry. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going through a night owl stage, so I'm, I'm, I'm probably only going to need to sleep in about an hour or two. So I'm not going to go to sleep now. I'm not sleepy. So I will yeah. probably. That's why I kind of offered. I'm not recording anymore. I just turned it off. But uh, that's why I kind of um, 